Beverly Leach is perhaps best known for her portrayal of Kate Monday on Square One TV's MathNet. Her other roles in her extensive television career include Babylon 5, Alienation, Star Trek Voyager, Northern Exposure, JAG, and Modern Family. She is also the author of Actor Muscle, Craft, Grit, Wit, a professional guide to the business of acting. But us Quantum Leap fans know her best as Katherine Farrington in the 21st episode of Season 2 of Quantum Leap, Seabride. Albie recently had the pleasure to speak with Beverly about Quantum Leap, her book, and career. This interview has a spoiler level of Seabride. And now here's Albie with Beverly Leach. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. I'm uh, glad I get a chance to talk to you. I appreciate you doing this for us. No problem. I, I loved working on this show, so brought back a lot of good memories. Did you say you just watched it? I did. That's awesome. I did. It was, yeah, and uh, literally it, it brought back a lot of good memories. It was almost like it happened yesterday. Thank you for doing yeah. that. I know you have a book I think I saw on your Facebook. I do. I have a book. I started teaching a few years ago. I used to study with Stella Adler. And uh, she was a great influence on my life in terms of just teaching great acting. But she was also very dedicated to teaching other people. She was a great actress herself. And she used to talk a lot about passing it on to others. And um, a few years ago, I started teaching and uh, I got picked to develop a curriculum at an academy for the business of acting because I'm still a working actor. And uh, so I developed this curriculum and I realized that only those 50 kids were getting it. You know, and I thought, well, this would be this would be a great, you know, business manual for young students, young actors who are either new to the market in Los Angeles and are working their way up or other graduates at other schools. So I went ahead and I I fleshed it out and I made it into a book. And it's it's a very good. It's a very relevant and a very helpful to people. And my big objective was to make sure that they they whatever whatever part of the building of the career they were engaged in was to make sure that they they did it the most efficient way possible and the most professional way possible because there's a lot of uh, uh, bad moves you can make in the beginning that will lose you a lot of time, sometimes years of time, you know, especially if you get signed to the wrong kind of agent or manager and stuff. And there's a lot of scam artists out there too, a lot, a lot of scam artists. And they sound good, they talk a good game, but they're not really there to um, help the actor become a, a working professional. So I just wanted to give them a a good boost. You know? <laughs> What's your book called? It's called Actor Muscle, Craft, Grit, Wit, A Professional Guide to the Business of Acting. Where can people get that? They can get it on Amazon. All right. Yeah. We'll start off with some uh, questions about Quantum Leaf, if that's all right. That sounds great. How are you doing today, by the way, Albie? I'm doing good. Back at you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk to you. Like I said, I just watched, let's see, I watched Quantum Leap, of course, a couple times, and then I watched some other things you're in, uh, Star Trek Voyager and Alien Nation and Babylon 5. Oh, my God. <laughs> Alien Nation. <sighs> I forgot all about that one. <laughs> I had seen them all before, but, uh, you know, I just wanted them to be fresh in my brain so we could talk about them, maybe. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever you want. And what else did you watch besides Alienation and Star Trek? About three months ago, I watched MathNet. God bless you. I love doing that show, too. That was, yeah, you know, if I had five top shows, uh, Quantum Leap and MathNet, it's definitely in the top five, without question. I loved that. When I was a teenager, probably older than the demographic was supposed to be, but I, I did watch Square One and I watched MathNet. I loved MathNet. I had no idea Dragnet ever existed. I just thought it was MathNet. I didn't even realize it was like taken after something, but I always loved it. I did too. And you, that's funny that you said that. You were older than the demographic, but I used to get fan letters from adults. And the magic of that show came from the writers, you know? The writers used to be... Uh, great comedic writers. They did Sid Caesar, Show of Shows, they wrote they did vaudeville. So they, they really had a great sense of adult comedy and they knew how to sort of lay it in there and still teach the kids something. So that's why it was such a, a fan favorite with adults too, because they sort of got the jokes that the kids didn't. It was really, really fun to work on. It still seems pretty popular. Uh like I said a few months ago I watched it and I watched it on YouTube and each of the episodes are getting like eight to twelve thousand hits. So people like Isn't it. Isn't that great? Yeah. I amazing. know. It's still, it's still, yeah, I was, I, I felt very fortunate to have worked on that show. We didn't get paid very much money for it, mm. but I loved, loved doing it. You don't do it, you don't do those shows for the money. You do it because it's good 
you know, that it's going to be helpful and it's super fun to, you know, show up to work every day and wonder what, what's going to happen next. So the casting of it was great too, because they were able to, to stunt cast a lot of really big stars at the time to come in and play those characters. And a lot of them are still stars now. So are you good at math? Or did you learn anything from that? <laughs> did it teach me anything? Yes. Uh, yes, it taught me a lot. Um, of I was good in math. I didn't. I didn't get. Pa- I didn't stay good in math. So I, I made pretty good grades in algebra and geometry. So it wasn't that hard for me to understand the concepts of the show. But in college, I went into trigonometry and statistics and probability and all that, and I just was lost, absolutely <laughs> lost. I got through chemistry by the skin of my teeth. In fact, I didn't like the grade I got in it. And um, I took chemistry again because I've, I was always very stubborn about my grades being um, up there. And I got, I think I got a low C and I, I went, that's no good. So I took it over again and I got a B the next semester. But yeah, I've, I have a lot of uh, tenacity. I'm willing to learn. But statistics and, and trigonometry, too much for me. Couldn't get there. How about you? Oh, uh, not very good at math, which was uh, weird that I liked watching Square One and learning about math, even though I really am not good at it. It's like not a talent of mine, but... Well, that's the other magic of the show, is that they figured out a way to open it up for people who th- who thought, I-, I can't do this, you know? I'm sure I learned a lot. I, I know the Fibonacci sequence episode, <laughs> I-, I can't get that out of my brain, so... <laughs> that's good. That's good. Quantum Leap. Yes. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about your experience filming it? Working on Quantum Leap was one of the highlights of my career because it really it really allowed me to use the best of myself as a person, as an actress, use of my background and my training. I had uh, been a professional dancer for many, many years. I was classically trained. I did modern dance for a while, and then I segued into musical theater. And the the heart of this show that I recognized immediately was that it had a great balance. It really required a lot of uh, physical agility, not just for the tango sequence, but the physical comedy. I mean, I just saw the physicality of it, the comedic moments layered into all of the dramatic scenes. So I had those abilities because of my background in training in dance and musical theater. And I still had to be very committed to the dramatic aspects of this, you know, love-torn couple. But there were moments that were specifically written for the humor. And um, it's very rare that I get a role that allows me to play like that and also play as a romantic lead uh, with the heartbreak and the sort of ability to transcend my ego. I mean, the character was so spoiled and so rich and so shallow at one point. And the lessons of love and heartbreak allowed her to grow up, you know, and and speak up and have a voice and, and admit when she was wrong and do it without humiliation. She learned how to be humble. She learned how to um, feel a lot of pain, and she learned how to deepen as a woman. I mean, I really loved that, that there were places where you really saw how spoiled and and uh, dismissive she was, and yet in the bridal chamber scene between her and her mother and her sister, there was this ability to uh, go deeper and find a, a more of a woman, a gentler side. Um, a wiser, she gained some wisdom in this experience. And um, so there was a lot of uh, components in it. And I think that Deborah did a great job writing it. One of the producers, uh, Deborah Pratt, Deborah Pratt was the writer of this show. And she told me afterwards that she was so happy that I was cast in this because I did it exactly as she had imagined it, you know. So as a woman, speaking to another woman, I was just running on instinct and intuition and doing everything that uh, Stella had taught me to do to invest myself in the uh, dramatic content of it and allow my heart to break. Um, There was, I also have a a great fascination for all of the old uh, movies like Philadelphia Story and things like that. And there were elements of that in it. So it was a great big playground for someone like me. And I've always loved loved comedy. I find that my strong suit. And yet I needed, I had some dramatic chops. So it was, it was great. It was really, really great. Um, 
Dean Stockwell and Scott Bakula were great gentlemen on set, the greatest, really top-notch professionals, always authentic, always in the moment, and embraced me as a guest star. There's a there's a certain kind of um, landscape that that a guest star wanders into, <laughs> and they're not always welcome guests to the party. <laughs> it's like do your job and go home, you know. But mm-hmm. uh, they were um, they were very inviting, uh, very respectful of everyone on the set. I learned a lot from them as well, watching them because they were series regulars, you know. And I've been on a lot of different sets, and series regulars tend to um, act like movie stars. You know, and they don't have time and they they have a kind of invisible wall between themselves and other people. Uh, But um, Scott and Dean treated everyone exactly the same. And I noted that they treated the extras with as much respect and dignity as they did the producers and the director. And I love that. I love it when I see that in, in a leading man. I really do. The wardrobe you wore in this episode was amazing. You look stunning in it. Um, Jean-Pierre Dorliac. Jean-Pierre Dorliac. Can I just kind of get on my knees and build a shrine to him? <laughs> he built all of those costumes, especially for me, from the ground up. I did. I, was, I don't think I've ever looked that good before or since. I was I was truly lovely in that in that episode and he made sure that I was and I was so nervous about it too because I had I had just given birth to a baby I mean I was she was nine months old Wow but oh yeah and I but I was still nursing her and so I was kind of nervous about you know I I, I see the episode and I know that I was slender but at the time I knew that I used to be smaller than that. And so I was concerned that I wouldn't look good in my wardrobe because there was the swimsuit, there was the tango number, there was all sorts of things going on. And um, I was a little shy about exposing myself um, after Kate's birth. My, that's my daughter, Kate. And uh, yet he, he made me look like a million bucks. Oh, he's, uh, he's great. He's just the greatest. And no, we, we've stayed in touch all these years. We, we swap, um, uh, phone calls and Christmas cards and emails every once in a while. He's great. He's one of the greatest costume designers I've ever worked with. Yes, beautiful dresses, uh, even the swimsuit. The robe was stunning. (laughs) Uh, The peach robe was beautiful, wasn't it? Yes. I found everything to be so lovely. At the end scene with at the wedding, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I looked better in that scene than I did at my own wedding. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. (laughs) I just watched the episode twice, and you shouldn't have worried about anything because I couldn't tell you ever had a baby watching that. Thank you for saying that. I, I felt that I felt that relief afterwards, but that's also in part to uh, Jean Pierre. He made sure that all the cuts and the biases were just so, so that it always um, sort of enhanced my better uh, my better aspects and um, covered up the rest. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> you said you named your daughter Kate. Was that after your character on MathNet? Everybody asked me that. No, no, actually, uh, it's just um, serendipity that, that it worked out that way. My grandmother's name was Catherine. So her name is Catherine, so I named her after my uh, my memo, we called her. But, um, yeah, she's named after my grandmother, my father's mother. Those kisses between you and Scott Bakula, two of them in this episode. Most leading ladies only get one if they're lucky. You got two. How were those like? What was that like? <laughs> um... They were delicious. <laughs> they were delicious. Um, Scott's a very good actor, very, very good actor, and I am too. And, and to a certain extent, you have to uh, believe in the story. You know, it's it's not just memorizing your lines and, and painting an emotional wash on top of it. If you do your work as an actor, uh, you build up uh, an incredible history so that I can believe that I am that character and he is that man that I've I've loved my entire life, perhaps for eternity, you know. So there's a belief system that you have to fall into, and uh, it helped the kissing scenes. It just did. We never rehearsed. We never talked about it before. Um, we're both good actors that way, where we don't try to, you know, make it work. And it just, it was just a natural... I think um, I think we were lucky. We were like pieces of a puzzle that that uh, sort of found each other and just happened to fit. The opening teaser with uh, the kiss and the slap, mm-hmm. I did that once. 
I got one take on it. Wow. Uh, mainly because I got it the first time. If you really nail a scene the first time, they just say, uh, cut, print, and moving on. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, and that was actually the first time we ever met. That was our first day of yeah, shooting. That's funny. <laughs> so he was very surprised. Um, you know, we, we did block it for camera, but I never kissed him and I never slapped him. It definitely worked because uh, one minute into the episode, you're laughing. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, and he was very relieved that we only had to do it in one take because I really, I really clobbered him. I didn't, <laughs> I wanted it to count, you know, the slap afterwards, not the kiss. I don't mean I <laughs> clobbered him with the kiss. <laughs> and, uh, but the scene afterwards, that's the kind of comedy I love to do. Hiding, getting into the closet and then falling out. Were you in the closet long uh, on that shooting day? No, 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 it's just edited to look as if I've been in there forever. You know, it's acted and then edited, you know, so we, we did several takes of me falling out different ways and things like that and recovering from that and, and uh, being pushed into the, the closet different ways. It was so much fun. That kind of goofy stuff, that shtick is right up my alley. Really is. Most of that it looked to me like sets. Was any of it on uh, a, like a real ship or location like the pool or anything? Yes, a lot of that. Okay, so the opening teaser, all of that, I believe most of this was shot on the Queen Mary. Oh, wow. Yeah, most of it was. We went down to Long Beach and, and shot on the Queen Mary, like the tango, I believe. And the pool scene was also on the Queen Mary. I think the a lot of the other places, though, were built on the Universal lot. You just caught me with that one. I think, because I remember traveling to Universal a lot for this. So I'm thinking a lot of them were just sort of um, patterned after chambers in the Queen Mary because I think they were tight quarters and there wasn't enough room for the camera. Mm -hmm. So the set designer designed it, just took, a, just took a, a cabin from the Queen Mary and just redesigned it and had it built on the Universal lot so there would be room for cameras and they could take walls down if they needed to turn around and have more room to move. Now, interestingly enough, the garbage scene in the bowels of the ship where they're trying to kill him and they throw him into the trash and he's trying to scramble out before he goes into the water, right. that was entirely built on the Universal lot. Hmm. Entirely built. They even had a water tank around the trash bin with the operating doors to mimic the water. So every time it cuts to waters, the water's whooshing out. That was all built on the Universal lot. Wow. They used that. Yeah. Yeah. It was very exciting. Very, it was an enormous structure. It really was huge. So kudos to them. But uh, back to the pool scene in terms of the, the kiss, you know, I talked about the fun of the kiss and the slap, but um, there was that, that really hard scene at the pool. Speaking of the pool, um, that was a, that was a tough scene. That was a tough scene. And the kisses, uh, I believe, were part of what I was talking about in terms of believing in the tragedy of me, our self-belief and believing in the tragedy of this couple. You know, um, it was pretty steamy and it was very heartbreaking. I, I actually remember having to prep for that. That was a tough scene for me to do um, because I think it's my obligation as an actor to to really believe that I am who the script says I am. And um, when you work that deep in, in terms of heartbreak and loss and romance and unrequited love, uh, there's a certain price that an actor pays. You know, uh, we don't get off easy. We don't get off easy at all. Uh, it took me a, actually a couple of weeks to sort of shed that um, sadness. I was very, very sad before and after those scenes. So I didn't think about it in terms of being sexy. I thought about it in terms of in eternal, eternal love, eternal loss, and also um, the kind of growing pains that a spoiled, rotten brat full of self-righteous indignation. You know, she has to she has to sort of learn her life lessons, her soul lessons right there in, in front of him and in front of you as the audience. Um, so it was... It felt, I remember how, I, I know why it was so hard, because I felt everything all at once. You know, it was hot, it was steamy, it was love, it was very romantic. I had pride, I had ego, I had humility and humiliation. You know, it was uh, loss, 
um, heartbreak. You know, you have to feel all of those things in, in one scene. So that's why it was tough. But I had to pull on my big boy pants if I was going to play with the big boys. Job well done, I say. Thank you. I appreciate that. Could you tell me a little bit about working with some of your co-stars, uh, John Hertzler and uh, Juliet Sorcy? Juliet Sorcy. Oh, darling girl. Oh, my gosh. I loved my scenes with her. I just, she was so much fun to work with. She was great. Just loved her. And the guy who played my father, Weathers Farrington, his J.G. Hertzler. Right. <laughs> it's hard for me to say his last name. Yeah, me too. It's okay. He's a great actor, really great actor. I didn't actually get to spend much time with him um, because the the scene that we shot in the cabin where he's, um, you know, convincing me to marry Vinny the Viper and all of that stuff, uh, he's, he's just a pro. He shows up, he throws down, he goes home. And there was a lot of people on set, and they were they were really working at a, at a quick pace. So I didn't get to spend much downtime with him, but I admire him very, very much as an on-camera actor and as a voiceover actor. He's got a beautiful voice, doesn't he? Yes, he does. That, I recognized his voice before I recognized his face, because I'm used to him from his many Star Trek roles, where he usually wears a lot of prosthetics. Exactly. Exactly. His voice is gorgeous. And, and it turns out he's gorgeous in real life, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking of, you did a Voyager episode, and uh, you wore some prosthetics. What was that experience like for you? I loved working on that show. I was uh, rather surprised. That's awesome. Well, Ron Glass was incredibly handsome, very impressive in his acting technique. You know, he's truly Shakespearean in size in terms of his depth as an actor and as a man. He's really Shakespearean. He's like a, he's like a King Lear. You know, he's a king. He's a king. And he has a, a great uh, depth to him. You know, Maya Angelou has great depth to her and mm. dignity to her. And Ron Glass has that kind of depth and dignity to him as well. And so it was a pleasure to also watch him work because he was always so very calm and yet uh, focused, focused like a hot iron. He was great. I learned from everybody that I work with. You know, we play two aliens who are aboard a ship, and, and we would pretend to be medical personnel. And he's actually the captain, and I'm his ensign. And my experience working on that was I was totally excited to work with LeVar Burton, who was directing that episode. So that was the big kiss for me, working on Star Trek. Was, I was a big fan of LeVar Burton. The experience of working on that was um, also pretty wonderful. Uh, it's You know, when you get into a show and um, a franchise like that, um, it's got its own engine, and they have a certain way of working. I was a little nervous that they were going to put me in full prosthetics, and I was very relieved that they didn't. So um, they just had that nose piece and the little um, chin piece around the side. It was it was great working on that show. They they worked like a a perfectly timed clock. So that's what I meant about the working on a franchise like that. They have a method. And you have to work at their pace. You have to work on their level. You have to make sure that you listen to everything because they almost don't have to uh, explain everything thoroughly because they've they've been doing it such a long time and so well. They almost know exactly what the other person wants before they say it. So as a guest star, I really had to pay attention to the um, unspoken signals as well as the uh, spoken direction so that I didn't cause any time problems. You need, they, they work on a certain shooting schedule, and you have, to, you have to bring your product in on time. I was really, really pleased with it. Uh, LeVar Burton is a terrific guy, really terrific guy. I wish I had more to say about, although I have seen it, uh, Nightingale, that episode of Nightingale recently, I don't have as many memories of that because most of the time was spent in the prosthetics chair. And then as soon as I was ready, they threw me on set, we shot the scene, and then I, I went back to the trailer. It was kind of a closed set, if I remember correctly. They didn't want a lot of people there. I guess, you know, there's a lot of shows that are so high profile, they like to have a closed set in order to um, sort of keep their storylines a secret. Makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. How did that differ then uh, from when you did the voiceover work for the Star Trek video game? That was fun. The Laxis, that was actually very hard. You know, I'd done a lot of voiceover work and ADR work, mostly. And I thought that this would be really easy to do, but, you know, the games have their own kind of um, style, 
and timing. You know, when you do a, a commercial, you know that you need 17 seconds for a, a 30 second spot. You know, you have to get things in in 11 seconds or 17 seconds and things like that. With the games, uh, they had their own timing. And because I didn't have a visual to work off of, it was actually very, very difficult to do. So unfortunately, I wasn't <laughs> as capable um, in that sort of job as, I, as I'd as i liked to have been, I think. I think it, I might be too hard on myself at this point. You mentioned uh, commercials, and uh, congratulations, I saw you just did a Taco Bell commercial. Could you tell me a little bit about that? I'm kind of excited for that because I love Taco Bell. Well, I just signed um, a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't talk about it. All right. I can't. Uh, yeah, they're, the commercial life is now also because they're also stealing from each other. Did you know oh, that? No, I had no idea. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of of uh, stealing going on. They they And if they can produce their commercial, if they can steal from one commercial um, a campaign, but get it produced first, then they get credit for presenting the idea. Ah. So, for instance, uh, I can talk about Microsoft, the Nokia Windows Phone okay. a campaign I did last year. Mm-hmm. And I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. That I, and they would give me the copy to do for the audition, and they would immediately take it away, and I would have to <laughs> sign a non-disclosure agreement every time I left the audition. Wow. I wasn't allowed to talk to about it with anyone, and then even after the shoot, I wasn't allowed to talk about it or share photos on Facebook until after the commercial aired. And sure enough, you know, uh, the second one I did for, for Nokia uh, was uh, called The Recital. And it was all these parents at a children's recital, and you see the the grade school stage and the curtains open, all of that stuff. Right after that aired, about three other commercials, three other products came out using parents at a children's recital. And there have been movies and other uh, TV shows that have routinely stolen uh, storyline ideas from each other. So the big shows now... Uh, all scripts are confidential. They don't let them out to you unless you're going in for a producer session. They never release them, not even sides. Uh, you have to get them directly from the casting office. It used to be you could watch television and you would see one show on CBS, another one on NBC, and another one on cable. And the original storyline might be about a sick cow and a lost boy, you know. And sure enough, on, on the other two networks, there would be a story about a sick cow and a lost boy. Hmm. And that's because they used to post the scripts and the sides online for the actors to get to audition. And so that meant it was uh, accessible to anyone. So if they were at a loss on another network about a storyline, they would just <laughs> read the other network stuff and try to and try to produce a script w- with that, with those characters or storyline and, and uh, come out with it first. And it's happened with movies, too. So it's now part of the fabric of the commercial life as well. So I am, I just wrapped out a Taco Bell commercial. It was directed by Rick Lemoyne and um, the production company was Moxie Pictures. I can tell you things like that. It's all part of the new new food things that they're unveiling at uh, Taco Bell. You Mm. know, like the waffle, egg waffle breakfast. Very good. But now they have a, yeah, so they have a new, they have a new product that's coming out in Taco Bell and that's why I can't talk about it. Okay, well, I don't want to get you in trouble. No, you won't get me in trouble. Okay. I just can't, uh, but that's, I had to sign a non-disclosure. Isn't that crazy? Well, it makes sense. Millions of dollars at stake, really. Yeah, and they're spending millions of dollars, so they just want to make it count. You know, (laughs) they don't want somebody else to steal their idea. So, yeah, but I had a good time on that, too. It was really fun. Good. Um, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah. Can I ask you about Rita Allen Poe? Oh, yes, you may. You had mentioned that uh, you were a little self-conscious in the outfits on uh, Quantum Leap, but you didn't seem self-conscious in that episode. You were swimming in the pool. Yeah. Um, I didn't seem self-conscious, but I was. I cried before and after those pool scenes. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? There's so many Hollywood actresses out there who go, take off my top. Absolutely. Don't I have a nice rack? Look at these <laughs> babies, you know, mm-hmm. who let the dogs out. I've I've always had... Um, a kind of sense of um, modesty about me. It's been, it's always been really difficult for me to um, be exposed in that way. And I don't know why. 
I don't know why that is. It's just sort of natural to me. Um, and I, I don't think I'll ever get over it. I'm, you know, I'm pretty up there in dog years now. And I'm still modest, shy about that. The working on Alien Nation was quite a different experience uh, from the others. But this is where um, me not knowing a show sort of caused trouble for me. Uh, actors really need to, and this is where I learned this lesson, by the way. I talk about it in the book as well, about knowing the show. They cast me because I was right for the role, and I did a good job with the role. I think I did okay. Yes. I was good enough. You know, I didn't embarrass myself. I think I did a good job, and, and I hit the notes that I wanted to hit, but I didn't know the show. I hadn't watched it. I'd seen some billboards. So I was I was cast for the role, and I was right for the role, et cetera, but I didn't understand the style of the show. I didn't understand the actors. I didn't understand the scripts. So that one was a hard one, and it was a really good life lesson as an actress for me that if I'm going to work on a show, I really need to watch episodes. I need to read all interviews and copy that I can find, you know, press releases, things like that. Um, thank God for the Internet. Back then, we didn't have the Internet, so I couldn't do that much research. We didn't have DVRs. We didn't have, you know, DirecTV where you could um, save the shows. Remember remember the old days when you had to, like, uh, set your VCR yes. on a timer yes. to catch it? So, and so it, was, it was one of those instances where I felt like I was flying blind the whole time. But I learned a huge lesson from it. And ever since that show, professionally as an actress, I always, always watch the show. I read about the writers, especially. I look at their other work. I look at their movies. I uh, familiarize myself with the other cast members because I really need to follow. Each show has its own kind of style, like a thumbprint, and it belongs to them. And you don't know the pacing or the timing or the tone unless you invest of yourself in that. So what it was like for me to work on, the show was, the show people were fine. They were very fine to me. Um, it was business as usual. Uh, they were lovely to me. Uh, I didn't get to spend much time with the cast members. I just had to show up and do my job and go home. It was kind of uh, detached in that way. I think that if I had been more familiar with things, I would have personally felt more comfortable stepping in into that setting. But that bad was on me. The director was great. And the writing was, uh, I thought, was really fun. And I haven't played, I remember one line from that show where I decided to be a little Marilyn Monroe-ish. And it always made me giggle just a little bit to see. <laughs> I think when I'm sunning myself at the pool and I've got sunglasses on, I okay. don't know. It's something, yeah. I'm getting a flash on that right now. I have a little silly question about alienation. I have a theory uh, on this podcast as we, we go along. When there's a episode with a mystery in it, the red herring always seems to be someone with red hair. Uh, were you cast because of your red hair in that, or was that talked about in alienation because you were sort of a red herring and you had red hair? Wah, wah. <laughs> I see. Um, no, I think it probably... I believe I had the red hair left over from another show I did. It was Sledgehammer. Ah, yes. Love that show. Yeah, I love that show, too. It was funny. Alan Spencer. What, a, what Funny. What a genius. Yes, Alan Spencer. He's the best. Um, they had dyed my hair red for that episode, and I still had it. Uh, and sometimes they ask you to go back to your other color, and mm -hmm. I was a blonde before I did Sledge. And um, I think they just asked me to keep it. They said it worked. Let's keep it. Okay. Yeah. I think it would just sort of worked out that way. I don't think it was on purpose. It just, it was a great show to work on. I'm a big science fiction fan. I also loved working on Babylon 5. My dad was especially happy that I was working on these science fiction shows because my dad was a huge science fiction fan. And so <laughs> I've worked on a lot of sci-fi. I'm just sort of racking them up in my head going, oh yeah, you have. You're a part of this culture. You're a part of this genre. And it's a good one to be a part of because I'm also a science fiction fan. That's awesome. Yeah. As you can tell, maybe I am too. Um, <laughs> I can see that. Babylon 5, uh, what was that like for you? Was that going to be a recurring role or did they tell you maybe? It was. It was going to be a recurring role. And then Bruce Boxleitner was my brother and I was sort of introduced as his, I think his sister. And um, I think something happened offset. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't about what was happening on at the studio or on on the set. It had to do with things happening off camera mm -hmm. uh, in in other people's lives, other places. 
And I think things just got sort of sidetracked, but I loved working with him. He was a, he was a lovely guy, really easy going. I felt like he was my brother. Oh. I, I was, and I was playing his sister. So it, it works out, doesn't it? Yes, it works out. <laughs> He was a uh, lovely, down-to-earth guy, treated me. He was very generous with his time and his camera time. Yeah, he was stand-up guy, very, very good stand-up guy. That's good to hear. Uh, very good episode, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any funny stories or anything that happened on the set that uh, our listeners might like to hear about during their filming of Quantum Leap? I, I don't know about funny stories, but my favorite line of dialogue, I thought the best line came from Dean Stockwell in the first scene when he calls my father a pompous nozzle. <laughs> that was the best. That was really the best. Um, here's a, also a piece of trivia. James Harper, the guy who plays uh, Vincent Loggia, right. Benny the Viper, he and I are great friends. Oh, really? Yeah, and he's a great guy. Oh, my gosh. We both have big uh, theater backgrounds. I think a uh, funny story... Well, of course, my very favorite scene was the tango, and that was the most fun to work on because I, I had all this dance background, and of course, Scott Bakula is, is an incredible dancer and, and entertainer himself, which uh, is always helpful. So that I think that was the most fun. That was the one I was the most excited about. The second favorite was probably the kiss and slap scene and then going in and out of the closet. That was the most fun. Let me see. I'm trying to think of good stories. You're going to think I'm a, a cuckoo about this, but I am going to go ahead and just say it. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but it's said that the pool at the Queen Mary is haunted. And there were times that, you remember when I said that the, the pool scene was very, very hard to do? Right. There were times that that was also contributing to why it was so hard to do the scene. Because uh, the energy would shift in there, and I'm kind of sensitive to that. <laughs> and I didn't see anything. It's not like I, I saw anything, but I felt things. And it would it sort of threw my focus a little bit. There were just unfriendly areas to stand in. How does that sound? It sounds so, right. Does it sound right? Yes. <laughs> I hope I don't sound like I'm nuts. But So when I'm standing at a certain point you know, off off camera to make an entrance or um, at a certain point of the stairway to go up it and, and do coverage and things like that. There were just unfriendly areas, not the entire pool area, but there were places that I was required to stand in to wait for a, an on-screen entrance or exit. And um, and it just felt, uh, felt, it felt hard to get through. And uh, that was, I found, very interesting. And I didn't even know that they considered it haunted until after that scene was shot. Because there were some takes that I was in the middle of, and I would suddenly go up on my lines for no apparent reason. I mean, I knew the scene. I'd done all my work. Uh, Scott, Bakula, and I were working beautifully together. There was no reason for me to suddenly forget my lines. That's what going up on your lines means. Um, or I would feel something different than I was, what I was supposed to feel like um aggressive there were <laughs> there was a couple of scenes that i just cut myself you know where i went i'm not going to go on can we cut this and let me start over uh, because all of a sudden something inappropriate would jump into you know my feelings my emotions and it felt very aggressive like i wanted to hit somebody wow and i thought no i can't <laughs> That doesn't belong in this scene. So I'm not going to move on because I don't want the editor to ever use anything that's not going to be useful to him. Mm -hmm. So that only happened once or twice. And standing in unfriendly areas uh, only happened maybe three times. Uh, so most of the scene, most of those hours were spent, uh, were, were well spent, and they were very productive and, and very uh, beautiful to work on. And then there were these these rare things that sort of like would skid into the scene, sort of. And I go, where did that come from, you know? So, uh, but that was it. I hope your your audience doesn't think I'm um, cuckoo about that. But years later, I did see this program where they claimed that, you know, the pool area at the Queen Mary was haunted. And I went, well, that must have been it. How interesting is very that? Very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, right? Um, are you a, a Ghost Hunter fan? I've never had any experiences myself, but our our next episode of Quantum Leap has to do with a ghost. Oh, really? Yeah. Great. I think I think that's it. I think I have I think I have lots of interesting uh things. I I glow when I think about the 
the tango scene. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, and and uh, it's the one and only time I've really, I think I've ever been given the opportunity to dance on screen. Maybe dancing with the stars in the future? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the other thing that's sort of, sort of kitschy trivia is that Patricia Hardy, the woman who played my mother, she and I studied with Stella Adler at the same time. Wow. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know if you knew this about Joe Napolitano, the director of that. Do you know anything about him? No, not at all. Joe Napolitano was a a very, very capable director, very serious about his work. He's like most uh, good directors. Comedy is very serious business, you know, and he was on top of everything, listened to his actors beautifully. But what's interesting about Joe Napolitano is that he's really worked with some big, big directors like Brian De Palma in Scarface and Untouchables and uh, Terry Gilliam in The Fisher King. And he was always their first assistant director, first AD, which is actually a very powerful position on the set. And it's said that first ADs learn to direct, but they mostly learn to produce in that position. And uh, they really know how to run a set. So he was a very strong first AD and worked with some great, big, huge directors. So I know he was gifted and had great ideas coming in. And I I believe that since then, he's become a producer on some level, too. So that uh, that was an interesting trajectory for me, um, listening to his stories about Brian De Palma and working on The Untouchables and things like that. He was a cool guy. He was a really cool guy. So uh, good to work with. Good to work with. Very good to work with. Um, It was a strong choice for that episode, definitely. So overall, very positive experience on Quantum Leap? Very positive. Very, very positive, yes. Do you do many sci-fi conventions? I don't. I've never been invited. I I remember going to some Quantum Leap conventions uh, a couple of times. Yeah, they invited us and and, uh, brought us out uh, a couple of times, but it was specific to Quantum Leap. But I haven't ever been invited to the sci-fi conventions. What character do you get recognized for the most? The most? um, Well, Quantum Leap, obviously. Uh, Star Trek. And, you know, I I still get hits on uh, the Babylon 5 and uh, Alien Nation, which is kind of a stretch. I'm always surprised when people bring up Alien Nation, so <laughs> you probably heard that in my voice. <laughs> um, but mostly Star Trek and, and Quantum Leap. Sci-fi fans are very loyal, so they'll, they'll remember someone from their favorite episode or something. They're very, very loyal, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about your book? Oh, yes. My book is called Actor Muscle, Craft, Grit, Wit, A Professional Guide to the Business of Acting. It's a book that's been specifically engineered to help young actors enter the market, whether they're graduating from um, a theater or film program or just new actors who move to the Los Angeles market. And each chapter is laid out sort of in a sequential order, and it gives you the most up-to-date protocols on how to build your career. So, you know, some actors don't get their pictures and resumes put together, but they still list online with... Actors Access and Casting Frontier and all these different places where you need to self-submit until you get an agent, but you can't self-submit without a picture and resume. So there's tons and tons of actors who don't know what comes first. You know, you have to do the next indicated thing, and how do you do that? And so I I explained to them how to uh, choose a photographer, how to choose the right photographer, what they're looking for, what kind of picture uh, or an actor an agency is looking for. So you have to sort of tailor your taste uh, spend your money well and do it with a with an eye for the future. So a lot of time is spent in the first opening chapters that has a game plan attached to it. Some kids just come here and they just say, I just want to be a star. I just want to be an actor. But they really don't know what to do. That's sort of a big, big picture with a fuzzy outline. It's not very clear or pragmatic. So I start with a game plan of what you need to do first and how to do it in terms of getting yourself set up. And then as you get deeper and deeper into your career, each chapter is a sequential step. So once you get your picture and resume together and you get listed online, you start self-submitting and build your resume, uh, you start collecting tape on yourself, and then you can start looking for an agent because an agent's not going to sign anybody without 
uh, some road wear on them. They need to have a good they need to have a good resume. And so, how do you find an agent? I teach them how to find an agent, what to do in an agency interview, and what not to do in an agency interview too. I do that too. I also talk about self taping, self submissions, things like that. I also talk about the agency and manager contracts. That seems to be a huge, scary mystery for a lot of actors. And there's a great detail. And it's an in-depth conversation about what the difference is between an agent and a manager, what the contract looks like, what a bad contract looks like, and what a good contract looks like, and what to expect and, and how to negotiate that for yourself if you, if you don't like what it says. And then I talk a lot about scams. Uh, what to look for, what are the earmarks for it, because there's a lot of them out there. And there's a lot of bad teachers out there, too. Uh, teachers are just as, as likely to be scam artists as um, as agents. And, um, you know, big glowing want ads that say, have your own reality show, experience not needed. <laughs> <laughs> Models, actors, wanted, no experience necessary. You know, there's still that going on. And so the, the book is very practical. It's only 164 pages. It's very detailed. It has step-by-step, in-sequence actions for each actor to take. It even has things like how to do a cover letter and how to, to uh, get the attention of, a, of an agent through a package and things like that. A lot of actors make a terrible mistake by only emailing agents their picture and resume when the truth is only 2% Maybe 4% of agents accept email submissions, which is odd because the internet is so prevalent. Everybody thinks that's the fastest, easiest, and cheapest way to do it. But most of their listings in the call sheet and uh, other agency handbooks, it very clearly says headshot and resume by mail only. Do not email. And the actors aren't paying attention and they email and, and they wonder why they're not getting a response. So... There's a lot of attention given to doing a proper package to an agent, what to say in the cover letter, how to do that, how your resume and picture should look, and, um, you know, all of that. It's all about a professional presentation. And there's nothing like getting that from a working actor. People would just say, that's so old-fashioned. Nobody does hard, hard copy submissions anymore. And that's not true. I know what agents want. And I, recently, I went through an agency shift myself. And so I put my money where my mouth was. And I only sent out 12 packages. And every single interview I had with an agent, each and every one of them said, I was so happy to get your hard copy package. I was so happy that it wasn't an email. <laughs> we tell them not to send an email and they still email <laughs> us. <laughs> you know? So it, it makes a difference. But you got to know how to make it look pretty and you got to know how to, to be professional and brief about it, you know. Sounds like a very useful tool for people that dream to be an actor. It is, actually. And, uh, you know, I've only had it out for a couple of years, and I self-published it, which um, was my desire to do. I just sort of wanted to uh, put it out there. And as it turns out, a lot of colleges have started buying it uh, this year for their graduating students. I sent out free review copies to a lot of California universities, with a letter suggesting that their theater graduates or their film graduates might benefit from this book. And I sent to each head of the department a free review copy. And I've, in May, I had a ton of orders from different universities as sort of a parting gift for their graduates. Uh, mm. So I guess they read it and said, yes, it is. This is a professional, this is a professional manual. This is all legit. And um, a couple of other, let me see, Samuel French picked it up. Drama Books in New York picked it up. Uh, another... Dramatics Magazine that heads uh, EDTA, it's a Educational Theater Association. They also um, bought up a, a bunch of those and they sell those to actors who come in and just buy it off the shelf. So it's, it's there to be helpful. I'm not here to make a million bucks on this. I'm here to be helpful. And I can teach artistry one-on-one -on -one in person, which is the way it should be done, acting, uh, training and things like that. Uh, from Stella, but in terms of professional protocol, that can be learned from a book. You know, just keep it on your bedside. It it works in every situation for every level of career too. You said to say a few words, and I just went right off on that. No, that's I? great. You're you're doing great. <laughs> okay. Okay. Before we go, is there anything we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? I am always surprised and always honored by the fans who support me. 
I guess it's not that I don't think so much of myself. I just try not to think of myself a lot. <laughs> I try to take it one day at a time and, and um, stay easygoing and down to earth. And it always um, humbles me and pleases me all at the same time that I have fans. I have fans that support me and and I support them. And it means that I'm, I, might, I might be doing something right. And that's that's a good mission to have in life, I think, is to um, use my gifts for good and not evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you a question okay. about that. Sounds good. I have a theory about why science fiction is so fascinating to people and why they have such a lifelong attachment to it and why they're such diehard fans. What's your theory? Why do you, what do you think is the magic of of science fiction. For me, I think when I was a teenager, uh, you know, teenagers are very difficult and every problem you have is end of the world. And um, yeah. for me, it was about escape. You know, I might have had a bad day at school or maybe I didn't quite fit in. I didn't have friends or I was being bullied. But when I came home, I could sit down and watch my favorite sci-fi show and escape into that world. And in that world, usually in science fiction, especially around the time of Quantum Leap and Star Trek, it wasn't about what you were. It was about who you were. And people weren't made fun of or bullied. And it felt like uh, you were accepted into that world almost. And then when you meet other people that share your passion for the same television shows you do, you kind of instantly have a connection with them. That's my take on it. My thought now, of course, I've had a lot of years to sort of sit and ruminate on it. My thought now is that science fiction is all about the unknown. And the unknown is so frightening. You know, it's so frightening. And I think that at any given moment, I have a choice of either of succumbing to the fear and being frightened of it and shutting down or running away, or I have the choice to say, I don't know what this is, and I'm okay with that. It's almost like embracing the big mystery and saying, I don't know, and I love it. I love not knowing. And isn't this a wonderful adventure to go on? Mm. So I can either be frightened by the unknown or embrace it as something as that it's supposed to be unknown. <laughs> I like that. Sort of like, you know, you like that. I, I yeah. hope I'm not talking in circles, but it's, it's kind of like that. And that, uh, and then what I can do is when I'm here on earth, you know, I can look at things that horrify me or displease me or make me uncomfortable. And I can say, I don't have to have all the answers here. I don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes I can just um, let things play out and not be frightened of it because it's a mystery and it's supposed to be a mystery. But I can, I can um, do the next indicated thing. I can do what, what appears to be the right thing to do. It doesn't mean I, I can be inactive or not take action when it's required of me and have the courage to do that even when I'm afraid. Because that's the other thing all of these science fiction people do too, all these leading characters. They do the right thing. They do the courageous mm -hmm, thing, mm -hmm. even when they're scared out of their wits. Right. You know, even when it seems unsolvable and improbable and, and fatal. So it really engages a lot of the, I, I think, natural hero in all of us. And, and I think that's worthy of a fan base because I think we all have that, even if we're sitting on the couch uh, with a remote eating popcorn. <laughs> right. Exactly. It taps, it taps into everybody's inner hero, you know? Exactly. We, we all wish we could be them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And there's a, a natural morality to it, too. There seems to be a, an, a, an ethical place and a, and a natural morality to it as well. So um, that's me talking in really broad terms. Oh, my gosh. I didn't mean to be so <laughs> philosophical. Um, that's interesting that you said that about being bullied or made fun of. Is that what happened to you? Uh, yeah, I had a rough childhood. Me too. I get it. But television and the escapism helped me and also the hope for a better future. And, and like I said, uh, when I met people that also loved the same shows I loved, like Quantum Leap or Star Trek, and uh, we understood each other. So I was able to build friendships through that. Right. Isn't it wonderful what story... That's, that's the mission of actors, is to be good storytellers, because you bring people together through that. And um, good. I'm glad to hear that. You found, you found your people, right? Yes, yes I did. I did. I had a I had a rough childhood too. It looks like everything's pretty rosy. Mm -hmm. 
that I ran to dancing and acting because it gave me um, my escape from that. So I get the bullying quite a bit. And um, I wasn't always pretty. I was the most <laughs> surprised by that, to tell you the truth. I don't know if I People, believe you. I, I I believe you'll have to. You'll have to. I was quite the uh, short, fat, hairy, toothy um, squaw. I was really, <laughs> I was really a, a tomboy. Not not the, very awkward, gawky. I got bullied a lot for that, mm. it, uh, and um, made fun of a lot for that. For those very reasons, I was pretty ostracized. And then somewhere late in high school, I kind of went through very late. I think like senior year. Uh, all the way through college, I went through some kind of ugly duckling transformation, and um, no one was more surprised than me, except my mother. <laughs> hmm. Even she said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you walked in as this one girl, and then you walked out, and I'm just like, what? How did this happen? You know, I'm glad it happened, but how did this happen? We're all glad I, it happened. I, I'm all <laughs> glad it happened. Well, I, I have to tell you, um, having that early hard childhood, though, made me appreciate the finer aspects of being a good person, a good human. Being smart is good enough. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Having a good heart and because um, I was always the same person after I got pretty. You know, it was just the outside that changed, not the inside. I think uh, probably I had to go through those things in life in order to develop into a decent human being. And then the other stuff happened by itself. I, I still can't explain it. I probably won't get an answer to that until I'm standing at the pearly gates going, so you want to let me in on the joke? What happened here? <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, uh, I certainly took up a lot of your time. I, I appreciate it so much. Thank you so you much. You do? Okay. Yes. I just talked your ear off. but uh, I loved it. Oh, good. And uh, I had a wonderful afternoon with you. Thank you so much for thinking of me and uh, making me a part of this. <laughs>